She was very, very white. Just nothing roused her. This isn't something that was just going to go away. I didn't know if that meant that Maya was going to die. I just remember waking up in unbelievable pain. We were in panic. Finally, it hit me like a ton of bricks that my daughter could die. Next, three medical mysteries that defied the experts. Almost from birth, Maya Cooper suffers from bizarre symptoms, but her doctors have no idea what's really going on inside her body. I had been with her every waking moment. This was very scary for me. Then, a simple surgery leaves Jackie Romilly fighting for her life, but no one believes her. I just remember burning up with fever and an excruciating pain. And Tim Donovan is a healthy 13-year-old until a routine physical changes his life forever. I was scared because, you know, what's wrong with you? How did they get there? When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. On May 20th, 1999, Jason and Amy Cooper's first child is born, Maya Ruth Cooper. We were excited, but a little bit nervous. Um, couldn't believe, actually, that we got to take this baby home. <laughs> Things were going pretty well the first few days, except Amy and I weren't getting a whole lot of sleep. So, but I suppose that's normal. But just two weeks later, Maya develops a cough, a persistent cough. The part that we were worrying about was that she was turning blue when she would cough. Alarmed, Jason and Amy rush Maya to their local hospital. They brought us right into the emergency room. She wasn't responding. I believe that's when they uh, alerted the code blue. I didn't know if that meant that Maya was going to die. Everything really went quick from there. They explained to us that she was going to have to have help breathing, that her lungs were full of fluid, which the day before when they took x-rays wasn't the case. Maya's condition is turning critical quickly, and doctors don't know why. She's immediately helicoptered to a larger hospital with a pediatric intensive care unit. We went in there, and there was our little baby just with lots of tubes and monitors, and uh, she was so small. Seeing your child in that situation really kind of takes you by surprise. I mean, you just you, you look at her, you want to hold her, but you're not sure if you can. Maya is isolated in the pediatric intensive care unit for three days as doctors run tests trying to figure out what's causing her life-threatening symptoms. When the results came back on Monday, she tested positive for pertussis. Pertussis, or whooping cough, is a highly contagious lung infection that occurs most often in newborns who haven't been vaccinated yet. To the Coopers, the diagnosis is a huge relief. Pertussis is easily treatable with antibiotics, and after 10 days in the hospital, Maya is healthy enough to go home. Maya really recovered quickly. Things sort of got back to normal. She eventually started nursing again and did really well. Um, she seemed to be growing. She was just becoming a little girl. You know, every day she got bigger and more beautiful and more fun. For the next five months, Maya seems fine. But when Jason and Amy try to introduce baby food into her diet, Maya won't have it. She was picky, picky, picky and just didn't eat much. But I thought, well, maybe that's because she was used to breast milk and it tastes so much different. We tried everything. We tried playing airplane. We tried mixing different things together. We tried uh, force feeding her. Are we torturing you? Are we torturing you? Are we torturing you? Are we you? I kept figuring, well, she's getting the breast milk and that's giving her what she needs. So we weren't very concerned about it. But as she grows, Maya continues to be a fussy eater, sticking almost exclusively to crackers, juice, and fruits. Then, in February 2001, Maya is 21 months old, when something disturbing happens. She started vomiting, and we thought, well, you know, it's just some kind of cold virus thing. The vomiting was so persistent and so violent seems like the wrong word, but it just, it was hard. Their pediatrician suspects that Maya has a virus and tells them not to worry. 
As long as she stays hydrated, she'll get over it in a few days. And eventually she does. We were kind of relieved, actually, that she stopped vomiting and we started introducing foods again. She seemed to be fine. And we went on with our normal lives. But 11 months later, the vomiting episodes return. And this time, Maya isn't recovering quickly. She really started to get uh, listless and just wiped out. She had stopped talking at all. Um, She'd kind of a little bit look at us, but she just seemed kind of spacey. The Coopers are terrified, and they rush three-year-old Maya to the emergency room. They decided to test her urine. I remember them coming back right away and telling us the lab had found a, a high white blood cell count, which meant she had some kind of infection. Maya is admitted to the hospital, and test results reveal that she has an acute urinary tract infection. Doctors start her on antibiotics immediately. But they are still puzzled. Even an infection as bad as this shouldn't cause vomiting and lethargy. After two days in the hospital, they still have no answers. But by then, Maya has improved, so they decide to send her home. We thought, hopefully, we won't have to be back in a hospital again. Um, we were very excited. But then, a few weeks later, Jason and Amy notice another strange thing about their daughter. Maya's hair always seemed to break off, or we didn't know if it wasn't growing or if it was breaking off. It just wasn't getting longer, and we were concerned that maybe there was something else wrong with it. The Coopers bring Maya to see a dermatologist, and what he tells them is extremely disturbing. He diagnoses Maya with trichotillomania, a psychological disorder in which the patient pulls out their own hair. And this, I really had a hard time believing because I have never seen her pull out her hair. I just kept in the back of my mind thinking, this, I just don't like this answer. There's got to be something more to it. Maybe if she ate more of something in her body, or maybe she needs to take vitamins. But the fragile hair isn't the only thing that has Amy and Jason worried at this point. Physically, Maya was um, doing things later than most children, uh, crawling, um, walking. As she got older, though, some more things that just didn't seem to click. She wasn't jumping like most kids. It was about the time we were thinking, oh, we wish she was potty trained. And one of the things that I had read about is that a child needs to be able to remove their clothing so that they can actually go to the bathroom and she still wasn't able to do that. And I thought, she's never gonna get this. Um, and, and I admit, at that time, I, I seriously started to wonder if maybe there was some mental delay. By the time Maya Cooper is four years old, she seems to have gotten over the strange symptoms that plagued her first few years odd infections and violent bouts of vomiting. But now it looks like Maya is falling behind developmentally, and her parents are worried. I did uh, bring it up with the doctor uh, a few times, and the response of the doctor was the kids develop at different uh, rates. But she was doing fine. But by 2004, it's time for five-year-old Maya to start kindergarten. And it soon becomes clear that Jason and Amy's fears about Maya's development are well-founded. She is way behind the other kids. Sometimes you would see her kind of doing like a blank stare. I'm not really sure that she was understanding what you were, you know, trying to get across to her. When Miss Block called us in, I remember um, she had done sort of an in-class assessment with Maya. There were some reason and logic type questions. Which is faster, a car or a bike? What happens when ice melts? And Maya didn't know that a car is faster than a bicycle, that ice becomes water. So the school has a program that they offer called Junior Kindergarten, and Miss Block suggested that that might be a better place for Maya to start. So we figured she was going to be fine. But there is still one nagging concern, Maya's hair. It continues to break off and won't grow. Determined to get some answers, Amy takes Maya to a new dermatologist. They took a sample of her hair, um, asked us a few questions, and went back to, to look at it under a microscope. They saw um, that her hair was breaking off in an unusual way. And they went on to say that this disorder can be connected to a genetic disorder. 
The Coopers have no idea what they're in for. The dermatologist sends them to geneticist Dr. Sarah Copeland. I walked in and introduced myself and explained to them a little bit about why they were there. She had Maya do a few things, walk and um, touch her nose and, and lay down. We knew that Maya didn't like tea protein. We knew that she had been sick multiple times and in fact had been critically ill at least once and that she really didn't tolerate illness very well. It doesn't take long for Dr. Copeland to realize that something unusual is going on. This was something more than just fragile hair. But she'll have to run tests before she can tell the Coopers anything for sure. This visit that we had with Dr. Copeland was on a Monday, and on Thursday of that week, uh, we got a phone call. Dr. Copeland has the test results back, and with them, the answers that the Coopers have spent the last five years looking for. We got there. Dr. Copeland talked to us and said, well, I've got to tell you that we've got some results. Maya does have this rare disorder, Arjunino Susnic Aciduria. Arginino succinic aciduria, or ASA, is a rare enzyme defect that leads to excess ammonia in the blood. Ammonia is a byproduct of the normal breakdown of protein into energy. In a healthy body, the enzyme Arginino succinic lease converts the ammonia to urea, a waste product which is flushed out in urine. But in Maya's case, that enzyme is missing, allowing the ammonia to build up to toxic levels. All enzyme paths in the body are a lot like a freeway. When your enzymes are working properly, all four lanes are open. But if you have an enzyme defect, you can have one lane blocked and that's fine. If you block two lanes, it gets backed up even more. And then if you close down all four lanes, nothing gets through. The cells can't function. The cells die. ASA only affects about 100 people in the entire country, but if left unchecked, the disease is fatal. I mean, that's when it really set in, when we found out that the children die of this because they, they don't know what it is and their body can't handle protein, which is in so many things. Then the thoughts running in our head are, oh my, what about those times that we made, that we made her eat the food? Dr. Copeland explains that ammonia peaks after consumption of protein. Maya's vomiting and picky eating were indications of her body protecting itself. She was trying to regulate the ammonia in her blood. But that wasn't all. Dr. Copeland explains that ammonia also peaks during illness or infection, making Maya's bout with whooping cough as an infant very serious. Anytime kids with ASA get sick, they're much more likely to get very sick. Whooping cough could be a problem. And the same with urinary tract infections or any kind of infection, ammonia levels go up. Any kind of illness is potentially life-threatening. Maya's fragile hair was a result of the missing enzyme as well. You don't have enough arginine in your body to make the hair shafts appropriately, so it gets fragile and it breaks. The Coopers are stunned by the news, but are relieved to learn that Maya isn't suffering from the most severe form of the disease. Basically, Maya's a poster child for mild ASA. They have periodic illnesses that tend to be much more severe than other children. I now had an answer for why she had all those problems. Dr. Copeland immediately has the Coopers change Maya's diet to restrict her protein intake and also prescribes the supplement arginine, an amino acid that will help Maya's body break down protein faster so ammonia won't build up. And Dr. Copeland told us, you're gonna get a whole nother child here. Today, Maya is a healthy six-year-old. Maya's doing excellent. She is growing like a weed. Her development has come along in huge leaps and bounds. In addition to the daily supplement, her parents have to strictly monitor everything she eats to make sure she doesn't get too much or too little protein. In the long term, Maya's going to need to stay on this diet. She's going to need to be careful when she's sick that she gets rapid treatment with IV fluids and IV arginine if need be. Newborn testing to detect ASA is available, and in a few states it's required. But most doctors have never seen a patient with ASA, making it difficult to diagnose. 
If you've never seen it, you've never heard about it, if you've never been educated about it, you just don't know about it. If Maya's parents had not been as persistent in following through with her broken hair, Maya may never have been diagnosed. If your gut really tells you that there's something wrong, keep pursuing it. I would do anything for my daughter. Maya Cooper's symptoms came and went over a period of years. But when something began attacking Jackie Romilly's body, she would go from bad to worse in a matter of weeks. In 1988, Jackie Romilly gives birth to twins. It's her second pregnancy and her second cesarean section. I had a very busy life. I loved it. Um, even having the babies, I worked right up until actually I was in labor. But after two cesarean sections, Jackie has developed incisional hernias. Her abdominal wall has weakened, and a portion of her intestines is poking through, causing a visible bulge in her stomach. The hernias caused me quite a bit of pain. Any kind of movement, getting out of the car, trying to pick up twins. In November 1993, when the twins are five, Jackie has surgery to repair the hernias. After spending one night in the hospital, she is sent home to recuperate. You know, I was pretty knocked out and in a lot of pain, so I just kind of slept it all away. But just two days later, Jackie begins to run a fever. I felt that I needed to call the doctor at the time. He said that it was normal for patients who had had an operation to run a little temperature and instructed me to give her two Tylenols. By the next day, Rick notices that Jackie's suture line is red and swollen and decides to call the doctor again. The doctor told my husband not to worry, that it was uh, more likely had to do with the drainage that I had and to soak the suture line and to, to, to promote the drainage. In the days that followed, I was noticing that even though I was wearing these very tight, what I would call brass girdles, my abdomen was filling up with fluid. If I touched it, it actually sloshed around like a water bottle. Jackie calls the doctor herself this time, but he tells her not to worry. They told me it was pretty standard after um, the surgery that I had. Still, 10 days after surgery, the drainage is getting even worse, and Jackie begins to panic. At her next visit, she shows the doctor her wound. He asked me to stand up, lean against the examining table, while he knelt on the floor and cut through a couple stitches. As he did so, the fluid rushed out of the open wound and sloshed all over him. And he jumped back. I was terrified. Ten days after abdominal surgery, Jackie Romilly is experiencing distressing symptoms, a high fever and a large amount of fluid under her sutures. At her follow-up visit, the doctor reassures Jackie that her symptoms are part of the normal healing process. He drains the fluid and leaves her with an open wound to care for. I didn't have the stomach to dress the wounds by myself, and so my lucky husband at the time um, stepped up and took over the, the procedure. One day, uh, changing her dressing, I noticed that the the wound had appeared like Morse code, a flat line, a whole flat line, flat line. I took one look at that and I said, whoa, what the heck is going on here? So we gave the doctor a call, told him about it. They didn't seem overly concerned, but you know, to show the doctor at our next visit. I asked Jackie, is this normal after a surgery such as this? And I asked my wife, I said, well, it doesn't sound right to me. So I kept telling her to go back to the doctor, and she said, well, he said there's nothing, nothing wrong, everything's fine. My phone calls to the doctor were that you're fine. Sometimes this is the way the course of surgery goes, um, and you're, you'll heal, but it's going to take longer. Jackie takes them at their word and tries to just grin and bear it. But another week passes, and her condition continues to get worse. I was still running fevers. Um, Low-grade fevers, just not feeling well, lethargic, fatigued. I would say I almost felt like, you know, I had the flu. I was in a lot of pain from, you know, it's not just your suture and your abdomen. It affects your hips. It affects your back. 
Following a routine surgery, Jackie should have been back at work in 10 days. But instead, almost three weeks later, she's still suffering. I was just trying to be the good patient, the polite patient. Um, I was almost in awe of this doctor because he was very, very highly regarded in the community. He was somebody that I, I put my trust in, so I was always afraid to make a problem. I had faith that everything was going to get better. Then, one night while Rick is away, Jackie's condition becomes critical. I just remember waking up several times during the night in just unbelievable pain. So in the morning, I forced myself to get out of bed, to get to the bathroom. I'm holding onto the walls. I just had no strength. I had a high fever, which I didn't know at the time. I looked down at my left hip, and I noticed that there was this huge gash open on my left hip. And I could look in, and I could actually see into my body. I mean, it was like a tunnel. I almost fainted. I don't know how I did it, but I got myself back to bed, reached for the phone, and called my mother. She says, Mom, I'm running a fever, like 103, 4 degrees. Ricky's out of the country. I don't know what to do. I'm, I can hardly walk. I says, call your doctor, tell him we're coming right down, and we're going to pick you up and take you over there. Jackie's parents make the 50-mile drive in 30 minutes and rush her to the doctor's office. I lay down on the examination table. My mother's sitting over to my right. The doctor and the nurse come in. Jackson told him what our symptoms were. I just remember my whole body's shaking, and my teeth are chattering, and I'm just burning up with fever, and I'm in excruciating pain. He takes a look at me and says, oh, you have the flu. I'm thinking to myself, flu? You know, she's no sore throat, no coughing, no congestion. Funniest flu I ever had, though. At this point, I wanted to go home. I, I said, thanks, Mom. You know, I, now we know. I'm going to go home and, and uh, rest. As we were going out the door, I turned around. He had walked into the nurse's station, and I looked at him, and I said, it would be, be the flu. Jackie's mother takes her home and tries to nurse her through whatever kind of bug this is. So I'm laying there in my old bedroom, kind of just staring at the ceiling and just not feeling good at all. I'm kind of scared, wondering what's going on. I had her for two days. Nothing was getting any better. I said, let me at least call Linda. She's my friend. She's a visiting nurse. Let me have her come over and see what she thinks. So I called Linda. On the phone, she had said, oh, her wound is separated a little, which is a relatively common thing. And I thought maybe she was just overreacting. But when I walked in the room, I was not prepared for what I saw. The skin was separated from the muscle. You could put apples in there. That's how big the spaces were under the skin. It was quite appalling. She turned to me and she says, take her to the emergency room now. In the weeks that follow Jackie Romley's abdominal surgery, she develops terrifying symptoms. Fever, chills, and now it appears that the skin around her incision is opening up, revealing her insides. She is rushed to the emergency room. They put me into an exam room, and by this time I was just so weak, I was so feverish, I was just, I was sick. Dr. John Pagnosi is the surgeon on call. Well, I received a phone call that uh, there was a patient who arrived into the emergency room um, that had large, open, uh, gaping wounds on the abdominal wall and that she appeared um, quite critically ill. Dr. Pagnosi examines Jackie and is horrified by what he sees. He was, like, flabbergasted. And he's walking around, you know, the examining table, and he said, sent to the nurse, look at that. Look, oh, my God, look at that. Even before the dressing was removed, one could... Um, notice a uh, foul smell coming from the uh, uh, operative site. When I removed the uh, dressing, the lower abdominal wall had two large, open, gaping wounds. I said to him, I said, you know, I've had her for two days. Is this something I could have done? He says, oh, no. He says, this infection's been brewing a long time. And at that point, he said, Jackie, take a look at this. I want you to see this. 
and he took a knife and he reached inside the wound on my left hip, which was this open gash, and he cut away the tissue out of the wound, and I didn't feel anything. Jacqueline's life uh, was in danger. I was quite concerned that she might have had uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is more commonly known as flesh-eating bacteria. It is an infection that eats away at the soft tissue of the body, killing it as it goes. It's fast moving, and if not treated quickly, it will literally eat the victim alive. I was really scared when they told me that. I just didn't understand how that could happen. He looked at me in the eye and he says, Vince, your daughter is very, very sick. I would call it critical. Finally, it hit me like a ton of bricks uh, that my daughter could die. I received a phone call from my father-in-law. I cut my trip short. I went directly to the hospital. Dr. Pagnosi orders tests and calls in infectious disease doctors to confirm his suspicions. But he is in a race against time, and before the lab results come back, Jackie is rushed into surgery. The wound needs to be cleaned, and the dead tissue uh, needs to be removed. The uh, dead tissue uh, can act as a real breeding ground for bacteria. Dr. Pagnosi's immediate priority is to stop the infection from taking over Jackie's entire body. He performs a procedure called debridement. Debridement is, is a process whereby you remove all the uh, underlying dead tissue down to what we call good bleeding points until you can actually see good, viable, healthy tissue. A good portion of the lower abdominal wall had to be removed. Uh, a good portion of the left hip area uh, had to be removed, including much of the skin and subcutaneous tissue, or the tissue that uh, helps support the skin layers. The next day, lab tests confirm his suspicions. Jackie's cultures show the presence of beta hemolytic streptococcus, the flesh-eating bacteria. She had a very serious type of infection. We'll see approximately three cases for every 10,000 uh, cases admitted to the hospital. For every 100 patients you see with necrotizing fasciitis, you can expect uh, approximately 25 of them to die. And perhaps the most terrifying thing of all is that the bacteria that cause necrotizing fasciitis can be found anywhere. You may never find a cause. Or you may be healthy one day, be exposed in the proper setting to a certain type of bacteria, and develop an overwhelming infection caused by this flesh-eating bacteria. Dr. Pegnosi tells Jackie her infection probably began immediately following her surgery, but was missed because the progression of the infection partially mimicked normal post-operative healing. The most common symptoms that we see is that the patient will uh, come to you, uh, they'll have high fevers, they'll have an area on their leg or their arm uh, that may be reddened. The patient will be complaining of numbness over the wound. If you don't diagnose the disease process very early, this patient will go on to die very rapidly. After two surgeries and almost a month in the hospital, Jackie is finally released and left to deal with the aftermath of her infection. Her prognosis is excellent. Her wounds are closed and healed. Uh, this problem uh, with regard to this infection is now uh, resolved. Uh, however, she has been left with a significant amount of deformity and scarring from this infection. The first time I saw my scars from the surgery stays in my mind, it'll always stay in my mind. My left hip was completely eaten away. It looked like a shark bite. Jackie was very depressed after surgery. She didn't feel good about herself because the scars had left her deformed. I think physically I got better, but um, emotionally and psychologically, it took me a very long time to heal. Slowly, Jackie has adjusted to her situation and often seeks out others affected by the disease over the internet. Today, she is the co-founder of the National Necrotizing Fasciitis Foundation. She also co-wrote a book about this deadly infection. I'm very proud of her for what she did. She turned a, a, a horrible situation into a, a life-saving one for people all over the world when she started that foundation. If you are experiencing anything that you feel might be abnormal or unusual, put your embarrassment, your shyness, your politeness aside and bring everything up to the doctor. If you are not satisfied with the answers, don't be afraid to stamp your foot. Don't be afraid to make a stink. 
You definitely have to advocate. You have to insist on what you want. The courage of having survived something like this is something that you can take with you and apply it to everything in your life. Jackie Romilly's illness masked itself as the flu and normal post-operative complications. But Timothy Donovan's illness had an even better disguise. In 1986, Kathleen and Dennis Donovan give birth to their second child, Timothy. Aside from being on the small side, he's healthy. Then, at 15 months, the moment his mother has been waiting for happens. When Tim and I would be driving down to the babysitter, you know, I'd look in the rearview mirror to keep checking on him back there, and I looked in one day and I saw the nose, the, the blood coming, and I went, oh well, we have a bleeder. Nosebleeds have always been common in his father Dennis's family. It was almost as if it was a badge of honor. It's just common policy in our family. We have nosebleeds. But other than the nosebleeds, which weren't all that frequent, Tim has a healthy childhood. In 1999, Tim, now 13, is about to start the eighth grade and is required to show that all his vaccinations are up to date. He goes to see his family physician, Dr. Andrew Hirsch. I had said to Dr. Hirsch, you know, he never had chicken pox then. He said, was he exposed? I said, yeah. And in that kind of situation, I like to make sure before I give someone a vaccination whether or not they truly need it. So we did blood work. The blood tests reveal that Tim does indeed need a vaccination for chicken pox. But the blood tests also show something else. His red blood cell count came back a little bit high. The typicals go a little over 15 to 16 for a hemoglobin count. His was a little over 17. Hemoglobin are the red blood cells that carry oxygen through the body. I was definitely concerned in this situation. First of all, elevated red counts can be normal, although they can herald a whole host of other conditions. And mostly I was concerned initially about a potential underlying cancer. Kathleen and Dennis Donovan have just received terrifying news about their 13-year-old son, Tim. His yearly checkup reveals an elevated red cell count, and their family physician wants them to see a pediatric oncologist. And I said to him, I know what you're looking for. You're looking for leukemia. I kind of felt like sick to my stomach, like all of a sudden, you know, this, is, this isn't something that was just going to go away. It's frightening, you know. My mom didn't tell me this at first. She just said that there was, there was something wrong with blood count, but it wasn't dangerous. We might have to go for more blood. What started out as a simple physical is now turning into a parent's worst nightmare. The Donovans immediately make an appointment with an oncologist. I remember sitting there with my mom and my dad, and it was a, like two other families there. It's a doctor's office for children, and it's cancer. And so, you know, it's a little very intimidating, very scary to be sitting there. You know, is that what he's going to look like? Is this what's going to happen? The oncologist performs a thorough examination of Tim. You're looking at the doctor's face. Are they going to give you a clue, like, OK, you know, what does she think? The doctor draws blood and orders a battery of tests but it will be two weeks before the results are back. It is the longest two weeks of their lives. You try to have a normal everyday life. You just have to. At least the appearances are that it's normal. As a parent, it's very hard to explain the feeling that you have. Very anxious, a lot of anxiety, but at the same token, uh, we felt we had to be strong. And obviously we didn't sleep. And, you know, you just sort of got to get up, got to go to work. For us, it just was a matter of just keeping busy because there was nothing you could do. Finally, the call they've been waiting for comes. Tim's red count is still high, but he doesn't have leukemia. You stand there and everything just drains out of you. And it's a good drain because, okay, it's not that. You feel like a million bucks. You know, we, we couldn't wait to get on the phone and tell our, uh, our families. But then we were kind of stymied because we still didn't know what was wrong. Then, over the next few months, things get worse as Tim develops a series of strange bronchial infections. And I got the cold. I get an antibiotic for it. It'd be fine. And then, like a week later, it'd come back. Like, it never actually went away. I went back to Dr. Hirsch and I said to him, you know, now he's sick again. He can't get rid of the cold. And I started getting frustrated because I was coughing all the time, and I was sniffing all the time. 
I looked back at his chart and I really felt that something else was going on. While Dr. Hirsch tries to decipher what's going on, Tim notices another change in himself. I started taking naps more often. They kind of progressed into two, three, sometimes even four a week. I just thought that it was the basketball was taking a lot out of me and school was taking a lot out of me. Tim's basketball coach sees a difference too. The normally energetic 13-year-old has slowed down significantly. And he had said, you know, I noticed that Tim's having trouble going up and down the court, that he gets very, that he's getting tired. You know, not that he's out of breath, there's a difference. Then, seemingly out of the blue, Tim develops an unusual throat infection. My mouth was kind of sore, and it was getting to me. And I kept telling my mom, you know, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. Kathleen immediately takes him back to Dr. Hirsch. His throat was very raw. He had patches of white exudate or pus throughout the mouth. And it actually looked a little bit like thrush, which is more of a yeast infection, which is very unusual. And I said to him, well, where would that come from? He said it could come from because he's been on antibiotics so much since, like, October. But, you know, he said, it's not normal. Thrush is a yeast infection of the mouth, usually found in infants, the elderly, and people whose immune systems are suppressed by disease or medical treatment. Dr. Hirsch is baffled. He said, well, there's something going on here that I don't like, and we're going to have to uh, pursue it further. I said to myself, especially with the way he looked, that I just had to, for my own peace of mind, repeat an evaluation. So I sent him for a chest x-ray, because I think we needed it at this time. Just a few days later, the x-rays come back. And the phone rang, and it was Dr. Hirsch. And he said to me, that the radiologist saw something. He said, but I got to tell you, I don't believe what he's telling me is true. I did have to see it for myself. As, and I, I ran right after hours over to the hospital and took a look at the films, and there it was. For the past six months, 13-year-old Timothy Donovan has been experiencing strange, seemingly unrelated symptoms a high red cell count, debilitating fatigue, and chronic bronchial infections, and no one knows why. Now, a routine chest x-ray provides a clue. I said, we've got it. Tim had an arteriovenous malformation that was very large. Arteriovenous malformations, or AVMs, are abnormal masses of blood vessels that form in the internal organs. For Tim, it is in his lungs. He had a ball of blood vessels bypassing the capillaries in the lung, bypassing the circulatory system, and, and bypassing the pulmonary system, therefore maintaining a chronic kind of lack of oxygen in the system with his body responding by increasing his red count. And I felt we've had it, but so I had on one sense a level of like relief and aha, on the other sense I said, oh no, what are we gonna do now? Doctors believe that AVMs form in utero or shortly after birth. They don't know exactly what causes them, but they do know that AVMs can be indicators of more serious conditions. The Donovans immediately send Tim's records to Dr. Robert White at Yale, who specializes in the treatment of AVMs. Dr. White calls the Donovans immediately. And he explained who he was to my husband and asked if there was another phone, and he said, put your wife on. I just had to ask one or two questions. Kathleen told us that this boy wasn't thriving. There was something wrong. Then Dr. White asks the one question he knows will clinch the diagnosis. Is there a family history of nosebleeds? Once I got the history of Tim, who had mild nosebleeds, and his father had definite nosebleeds, I knew we had a patient with HHT. HHT, or hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, is a rare genetic disorder affecting only about half a million people worldwide. HHT can prevent the body from forming capillaries, the tiny blood vessels that connect larger veins and arteries. It is in the capillaries that the blood gets oxygenated. In a person with HHT, the body forms abnormal blood vessels called telangiectasies when they're small and AVMs when they're large. These formations prevent blood from absorbing oxygen, thereby suffocating cells all over the body. I was very scared and nervous. I was scared because, you know, 
what's wrong with me? I can't believe there's this in my lungs. You know, how did they get there? What did I do? For Tim, these malformations formed in his nose, causing nosebleeds just like his father. And if that was it, Tim, like his father, would have been fine. But Tim also formed large AVMs in his lungs, blocking the flow of oxygen into the blood. This caused fatigue and left him vulnerable to illness. His body responded by producing more red blood cells to make up for the lack of blood oxygen. But no one picked up on it because all of Tim's symptoms could easily have been indicators of other more common conditions. This disorder masquerades for many things. In Tim, it was leukemia. In another patient, it's multiple sclerosis because they've had little strokes and they have funny things on their MRI. In other patients, it's nothing more than severe migraines. In others, they're presenting like heart failure. So it's a great masquerader. The AVM in Tim's lung also leaves him vulnerable to bacteria and blood clots. If left untreated, he could develop a brain infection or suffer a stroke. Dr. White has to stop the flow of blood to the AVM, taking it out of circulation, so to speak. This is done with a delicate procedure called a pulmonary angiogram embolization. One of Kathy's questions was, well, what's Tim going to feel? Uh, and I said, well, we're going to block this artery through the little catheter that I put under local anesthesia in the groin. And in fact, Tim's not going to feel anything. At that point was, we had a better understanding of what it was. I told her, I said, this is what we do. And we have eight centers in the United States that do nothing but this. We haven't had a death doing this procedure since the very beginning. In March of 2000, Tim arrives at Yale New Haven Hospital for the procedure. They put me on the bed and they brought me in. And I said to my parents, I said, all right, well, I'll see you later. These pulmonary malformations in the lung are short circuits where blood bypasses the capillaries and goes back to the left side of the heart. So our job is to block it safely. First, we get pictures. We put our catheter in, we neatly pack till we get a cross-sectional occlusion of the artery. We do it all with fibered coils. Once the artery is occluded, then blood will flow normally through his lung. After two hours, the procedure is finished, and it's a success. Tim is released after just one night in the hospital, and Dr. White tells the Donovans to expect to see a big change. It was instant, the results. Uh, it really was. It's amazing. I had more energy to run, and I could run now and not get out of breath. Today, Tim is a healthy 19-year-old college student and a member of the HHT Foundation, co-founded by Dr. White. Tim is no longer experiencing symptoms of his condition, but he must continue to make regular visits to an HHT center to keep the disease in check.